presentation first. <laughs> All right. So, hello everybody. Namaste. <clears throat> Since most of you are Desis here, I'm also a fellow Desi. And uh, yes, as Anup has mentioned, that uh, uh, we are very good friends. We've been going back uh, uh, quite a few years now, and we work very closely in uh, a lot of things behind the scenes that uh, most of you are not uh, aware of, uh, which is uh, uh, which is which is nice. And um, anyway, so I'm glad I'm here. I'm I'm going to show you guys how to do third-party application patching using the supersedence method, but. I want to inform you that, you know, while this capability is there in Config Manager, SCCM, uh, there are third-party application patching tools out there, such as Patch My PC, that will do uh, a much easier job for you. If you have the budget, uh, you know, get one of these uh, uh, tools. Um, if you don't have the budget and you are managing, you know, a few applications in your organization, and you want to you, you want to patch them because of vulnerabilities and things like that. My my uh, method will help you do that. Okay, so we'll just go through a PowerPoint presentation real quick, and then I will do a, a live demo, and uh, and hopefully I'll answer some questions. And um, okay, let me see. All right, so as Sanu mentioned, I'm, my name is uh, Ajit Dalawal. I'm originally from Malaysia. I live in uh, Vermont, USA, and uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, yeah, a config manager, MEM CM admin, um, and so on and so forth. I'm very active on social media. This is my Twitter handle, uh, you'll find. I have also a Tech Connect group on Facebook. Um, feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Anoop, reach out to <clears throat> How to Manage Devices. It's um, all great resources for all of you. We, we all do community work to help you guys in your day-to-day -day stuff. So supersedence, right? What, what is supersedence? Supersedence is basically uh, what it says here, a replacement of, a, of something that's old with something that's new. And Config Manager allows you to upgrade existing applications using supersedence relationship. Not a lot of people are aware of supersedence, right? They, they just create an application to push it out. And then when there's a new one, they create another one and then they push it out and stuff like that. There's a way of doing it where you can actually uh, check to see whether an application is older and then, and then you know, deploy a newer one to override the old one, okay? Um, what you see here is a little bit of a trickery. Um, you know, as you can see on the slide here, for example, like this, these are all uh, old slides uh, they, because I did a presentation uh, of this exact thing with Anoop, I think it was last year. So this, uh, the screenshots are, are old, so just disregard the, the version numbers. But for example, if you see Firefox here, there's a Firefox and then there's a Firefox legacy. There's a Notepad, there's a Notepad legacy. There's a reason for this, okay? So for example, if you look in the, um, uh, the master application, the main application, okay, you got your content location, like where the application is, uh, uh, installer is located on your source folder on your config manager server. Um, and then what, what are the uh, uh, installation command line and, and so on and so forth. Um, what are the detection methods? Any application that you push out, the, one of the most important things is the detection method. If you don't have your detection method set correctly, your applications will fail to install um, or, or will give you errors uh, when, you, when you do that. And then when you look at uh, the fake or legacy application, which I showed you earlier, there is no content location because I'm not pushing anything out. The installation command line doesn't really matter. You can put, you know, whatever you want. And I'm gonna show you all of this live in a demo, how to do this, right? And this is uh, a setting that you uh, enable the supersedence. And when you deploy an application um, by itself without um, uh, supersedence, 
you only have these options uh, available and required, right? And then when you look in the bottom here, it says allow end users to attempt to repair the application and then the next checkbox and then that's it. You don't have, you don't have anything here to say, please replace with the, with the, uh, with the supersedence. When you apply supersedence to an application, you get this third checkbox located in the bottom that, that says automatically upgrade any supersedence versions of this application when you deploy it. You go, don't get that if you don't attach it as a supersedence application. And I'll show you that very soon. And finally, this is, uh, again, um, please connect with me, with um, all of us uh, that you find on uh, how to manage devices. I'm sorry, Harjit, I think I, we lost the presentation. Oh, I think the presentation ended. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, all it's right. okay. <laughs> all right. So you guys can still see my screen? Yes. All right, good. All right, so let's do some demo. <laughs> And um, so this is my config manager, STCM server that you guys see here. I quickly, I had to rebuild my STCM server uh, just very recently. So, and then Anoop said, hey, can you do the session? So I had to quickly uh, build a few applications in here to, to show you guys uh, uh, today. And uh, so I'll just go through a few applications uh, I am sure most of you know how to create uh, an application, right? If the basic steps are you right click, you create an application, if it's an MSI um, or if it's uh, EXE or, uh, you know, uh, uh, application. MSI applications are pretty uh, straightforward. They are one of the easiest to deploy because when you choose an MSI file, uh, for example, let's try to see if I can find um, something as an example. Um, so let's just, uh, I don't know which one's an MSI here. Um, uh, maybe, uh, Okay, that's an MSI. So when you do an MSI, when it when it starts to create it, um, let me try to do zoom it for you guys. And um, see this here? It MSI was automatically give you the command line for you to use most of the time. The good applications will give you the command line. And this one here, obviously, is MSI exec slash install, and the you know the the installer name, and then slash Q for quiet installation. So if you have an MSI, that is one of the uh, simplest way of uh, of installing an application, and then you follow through. Uh, you do want to always, I always deploy applications as um, uh, for system. Um, one of the reasons is also because when you deploy as a user. Uh, hardware inventory and stuff like that does not uh, track those um, installations. They, they go under the user uh, uh, location on the systems. So you, uh, it's challenging for you to actually find what applications are out there um, and things like that to get, to get reporting. Um, Garth Jones from Enhanceoff has recently done a, a blog post about this and I can pull that up in a, in a little bit here and show you um, that information. So we won't do this, um, obviously. Um, and if you were doing an EXT, you know, you would choose manual, you put in all the date details, and next and next and next, and that's basically how you create an application. So what I have done <clears throat> is that I've created a few of these applications but you'll see here that I've got a folder called legacy, okay? So let me walk through, for example, 7-zip, okay? All right, so I basically did, I you know went through the steps of creating an application, 
you know, software center. I gave it an icon, gave it a name, you know, uh, deployment types. This is where you can you can select whether you have multiple. For example, if you created one here, uh, but you have like a x86 and a, a x64, you can create multiple uh, deployment types instead of creating two seven zip uh, applications here. Uh, you know, seven zip x86, seven zip x64. You can just do one and then add the deployment types here, which saves you a lot of lot of time and um, uh, hassle. So if we look at the deployment types, all right, it just picked up an MSI, all the information in there. Um, it, you know, that's where my source location is. Um, this is the the command line and so on and so forth, right? You know, it picks up the uninstall, uninstall. Um, command line as well and then the detection method because it's a MSI oftentimes it'll use the the uh, the hash of the uh, the GUID of the uh, application you can change to other things for example um, you know uh, registry settings or things like that um, or file system what this means is that um, for example, you would, if you were to change the detection method, what's happening here is this. When you deploy an application, <clears throat> you're trying to tell the, the, the application or the systems to check and see, do you look in this particular path, a program file slash whatever, does that exist? If it exists, does this file exist? If that file exists, does these conditions exist? If they exist, then do nothing about it. If they don't exist, then provide the application that's available or required to, to install it at a specific time. Okay? So what I'll show you, <clears throat> for example, I think I have 7-zip here somewhere. Oh, let's see, program files might not be here. Oh, there, 7-zip. So, so you go to C, program file, 7-zip, <clears throat> and then you just pick one of these uh, files. So I usually pick a, the DLL or the, or the EXE file that's located for any application. When you right-click on that and you do properties, and you go to details, <clears throat> File version, this is the exact um, information that you need, okay? So for example, this version of uh, 7-zip, it says that version is actually 19.0.0.0. So I create a detection method based on this, okay? Sometimes when you download the application and it'll say, oh, it's a version 19.0, but when you install it, this number here changes. It'll be 19.0.1.2 or something like that. So it has to be very precise, right? That's how you find it. You can choose a DLL, uh, it's the same thing. Right here. Okay, that's how you find it. So the other way to do, if you do file uh, location, uh, the, so I suggest that you use a wildcard such as percentage program files percentage. <clears throat> and then the location or whatever it is, let's say it's, uh, you know, whatever it was called, 7-zip and slash, right? And then that file was, uh, sorry, 7 zip dot exe and then you would say you know version is equals to uh what was that 19.0.0.0 like that the reason you use a wildcard and you you notice there is no let me zoom it again um, 
When I zoom it, do you guys see it? Or you guys um, lose the, the video? Uh, yes, we can, yeah, we can see it. We can see it. Okay. All right. So you notice there is no space between program and files. Okay. So you keep it all together. Percentage. This is to cover the locations when I showed you earlier. For the x86 and the 64-bit location. So you'll find... Hey, go look at these two two program file locations and see whether you find the seven zip folder or not. Is it in here? Yeah, it's in here. Is it in, in the x86? No, it's not. So skip it. So that's why you use this uh, this wildcards here. That's how you do it. Since I already have it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's basically the detection method for this one. And I'll go to some of the other ones. And then these things are just, you know, um, uh, again, simple. How do you want the installation behavior install as a system, install as a user, and so on and so forth. Whether or not a user is logged on, um, you know, this is always the one that you want to select. Because otherwise, if the user is not logged on, it won't get installed. And, you know, you'll just have more failures. Requirements, you can add, you know, various requirements. Do they need to be, um, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, do they have enough, uh, uh, you know, memory, how much memory, how much, you know, whatever. I usually don't mess with any of this stuff unless it's like very specific to an application that requires something. This is all defaults. I just leave them. I never, I never add anything here. Dependencies, you guys will know this is for when one application requires, uh, is dependent on another application to be installed first, for example, like uh, a .NET framework or a Visual C++ or things like that. So you would create this application, you say, wait, it is dependent on this other application. And you have to have that other application also created here in order for you to add it. Okay, for example, you know, I can say, oh, it requires uh, Adobe Reader or something like that. Okay, so again, I don't mess with this stuff unless I really need to. So once you've done that, um, you saved your uh, application, you uh, distribute it to your distribution points, and then you can deploy it. What you'll notice here in the properties of this application, there is a supersedence tab here, right? If you notice, I have not added any supersedence here yet. This application is deployed as available, and which means that the end users are able to select this application for installation in Software Center. It's there like a catalog. You know, I've got 10 applications, here they are, whenever you need it, go ahead and install it, and that's the version you're gonna get. And I'll show you how to do this in just a little bit here. Okay, so that's pretty simple, it's an MSI. Um, I've got another one here for KeePass. Um, again, these are just uh, examples uh, of applications for, for you guys. All right. Straightforward. I think this one's an EXE, if I'm not mistaken. Again, look in the path. You know, what's a program? Um, you know, does it have any silent switches? Detection method. Here's an example where it goes. Um, right. Uh uh, so, Harjit, sir, I just have one doubt, yeah. like uh, if there is in this path uh, percentage, program files percentage, so if this application uh, is for 32 bits, so will this program files detection will also check automatically in under program files x86 or do we have yes. to? Okay. No, it'll, it'll check. Yeah, it'll check. Okay, so it will check for both x86 and also for uh, normal program yes. files. Yes. Okay. Yeah, good, good question. 
Yep. So yeah. So if you notice this keypad, mm -hmm. it, it installs in you know in program files, uh, keypads, password safe to folder, and then I'm looking for the keypads.exe, and for this version, it was um, you know you can see here, 2.43.0, and I said equals to. Okay, that's that's the um, uh, the conditions that I I applied. Um, you can always, it doesn't have to be program files. Sometimes some applications, they're not really applications, but they are more like an applet. You know, they just get uh, dropped on the, on the desktop, you know, as a, as, a, as a desktop shortcut or things like that. Then you can change this, obviously, you know, browse to wherever that, that location is, you know, C slash users slash public slash desktop, whatever. And then, point to that particular thing that you want it to detect. Detection means, all, all it means is that, does this stuff exist or not? How does, this, uh, how does this application apply to it, right? So that's basically it. <clears throat> um, I'll show you an, another couple and then I'll do the legacy ones. <clears throat> Again, I didn't apply any supersedence because I want to show you guys how to do that. Um, I think one, <laughs> The interesting ones are, I think these are the ones that, uh, like you can also deploy like Flash Player for, you know, um, uh, IE and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Mozilla Firefox and stuff like that because there's always vulnerabilities every month. Uh, deployment types, let me see. This one might be a bit different. So see here, this one is a bit different. <coughs> so this one, I'm telling it to look in the, the Windows, uh, C Windows location. And then the SysWow64, look for this Macromedia and then Flash. Well, this is where Flash actually installs, okay? And then look for this particular EXE and that's what I, I did. And then or I also have an or condition here. Also look at, this is not a 64-bit. Uh, this is the traditional 32-bit. Look in this, direct, uh, this directory and find that file and that version number. So there's so many different ways you can do this stuff. Um, if I do... I think this one here, the Mozilla one, is also a bit different. I just want to show you guys some examples and what. So you can do it like that too, like C, Windows. All right, so now you guys know. So one of the things that I deployed um, was Adobe Acrobat Reader. And a lot of these applications actually have built-in uh, update mechanisms. So most of the time they just update by themselves. So Adobe Acrobat Reader, I'm gonna show you my workstations here in a second. Uh, deployment types. See the long string here? So that's the file version number that I wanted to find look for this file called acro, acro uh, read 32 exe and then i have supercedence built in here this supercedence thing i just created a folder called legacy and this is where i'm putting all my non-deployable you see they're not deployed uh, applications that become superseded that, that supersedes that that those other applications that you see. For example, Adobe Acrobat Reader, right? <clears throat> you can call this whatever you want. You can call this Adobe Acrobat Reader fake installer um, if you want. Give it whatever name you want. It doesn't matter because you're not deploying this. <clears throat> Deployment types, if you notice, Content location, 
I'm not even pointing to my source location. There's nothing. There is no application for this. It's zero. Program files, you can call this uh, monkey.exe, uh, you know, whatever. I call, just called it foo.exe. We all know that foo.exe does not exist. There's no such thing. Detection method, see? Here's, here's, I have a bunch more detections, right? I'll show you what they are. Again, I'm telling it, look in that path, look for that file, and look for that number. And then you see the operator is now less than. Before it was equals to, right? Less than. This is the operator I'm using on the fake installer to do the supersedence. I'm also telling it to look for if this does if this exists great if that doesn't exist look at this one and this one is Adobe Reader 10 because you can have um, uh, computers out there where people have installed very old Adobe Reader or old applications that they continue to stay there and they don't get upgraded to the new builds, right? So for example, Reader 10, um, Reader 9, Reader 8, and things like that. You can also say, sometimes you can change the, op the uh, conditions and say, you know, and or or. I'm saying if this doesn't exist, or this, or this, or this, or this. If you have a couple of conditions that you need, for example, I want to check this and also this this location, for example, like a, a, a registry setting and stuff like that. Okay, so now we've done that. And what I did, um, you know, let's do that on, on KeePass. Well, let's check on KeePass. So if you notice here on my workstation here, I've got one test works, workstation. In Software Center, I had deployed um, these applications. I've deployed 7-Zip version 1806. I've deployed uh, Adobe Acrobat, and I, I superseded it to this version because I deployed an older version. Notepad++. So we'll do one of these examples, and we'll show you that it'll get actually get upgraded to this new version, OK? You see my other work, workstations. Um, I've got the application, but I haven't installed it. So I can go ahead and install it. This is available. I can say, oh, yeah, give me Notepad too. I want that. Give me this. Let's take it all. OK. So eventually, they should, they should um, Come back with a success. I hope. I hope they do. They're downloading. They're installing. Installed. I think that one will finish too. So let's go back here. So the reason you 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 do this way of, uh, of supersedence is because whenever you, you are trying to do uh, apply supersedence, you technically have to maintain all the previous versions of a particular application. For example, Notepad++. If I want to deploy uh, you know, Notepad++ 785, for example, I have to keep 784 here, 783, 770, 7 whatever, and apply all of those as supersedents because those older versions could exist out there in your in your organization. So when you do that, you're going to have a huge list of applications here. When you do it the way I'm showing you this fake method, all you have to maintain is the main application. And you can put all of these here, by the way. You don't have to put, create a folder, right? Uh, for example, if I did uh, 
so I don't have one for Notepad++, but, uh, oh, that's a good one. Let's create that. Um, I just need to, <clears throat> I just need to grab this, uh, Okay, so you notice this one here, it says 7840. Okay. All right, so I'm going to create a brand new application because I have in my, uh, I should have 785 here. Yep, I have version 785. Okay, uh, ignore the, ignore this, just 785. Okay. So what I'm going to do, the way I do it is that you can come directly. You see, I already have a deployment here. You can you can undo, you can uh, you know delete the deployment and start again. You can modify this right away. Or if you want to be like really sure and say, you know what, I don't want to mess with this because in case I make a mistake, let me make a copy of it first. Notepad plus plus here somewhere. Yep, I do have it. Okay. Okay. All right. See, it creates a copy, exact copy of that without any deployments and also no, it's not distributed. So, what I normally do, I come to the main one, I will delete. Um, I'll just delete this. Uh, actually, never mind. I'll wait for that. Okay, I'll come in here. I like to put the version number right in the in the name because when you show up, when it shows up in Software Center, you see it right away. Even though you see it here, it, it's a visual thing that people can see. You can know the difference. So 785, you know, I'm still using the same. I, you see, I don't have to change a lot of stuff. I just have to change, okay, content location that is new. That was pointed 784. I say, look at 785. Okay. The program, yep. If you look in 785, it's called npp785installer.exe. All right, let so go back here. All I'm changing, I already have that same information. Uh, detection method, this is the one that I was telling you about. Some applications, you can actually just go to this installer, right click, details and it'll give you that information 7850 some applications actually you have to install it on a test system first then go to c program files or c program files x86 and go and look for that particular file you're trying to um, whatever it, it changes right so if you notice like i uh, here I'm calling it Notepad++ EXE because that's the file, but that's the name of the installer is different. So if you go to here, Notepad++. Okay, look here. Is it the same? Oh, well, I got a newer version, so that's okay. 7850. This is on my computer, not in my uh, lab. All right, so I'm gonna say this particular application is 7850 equals to this. Okay, everything's the same. I don't need to change anything else.
Come on. All right. So notice now I got two applications, right? The first one, which I deployed, and I can now come in here and delete that previous deployment, say, because I don't need it anymore. And you can then do a, you can retire it. And then it shows up here on the right hand side of say retired. So, you know, you cannot deploy that. So I'm going to distribute this guy first. I'm going to show you guys the difference between when you add supersedence and when you don't add supersedence. So distribute first. All right, I'm going to do a deployment. Yep, call it that. Collection, you, whatever collections you want, I'm just going to deploy it to my default. All right, so here um, you see you only got two options, available and required, and there is no third checkbox. All you can do is, you know, make it a, a, you know, is this a required? That means it's going to force it to install. For example, if I do available, it gives you a schedule. Always falls under UTC, but you can change it to your local time. So, by, for example, my local time is 9 o'clock. I'm just going to say, you know, 9, um, uh, 9.15 a.m. today. And... And then, you know, you go through this. If you do a required, it gives you this new um, schedule. It gives you when you want to make the application available to all the systems, and then when you want to make this mandatory for install, like force it, like by on this day, at this time, force it, and it's going to install no matter what. And if the user actually uninstalls this application, Notepad++, the next time it does its evaluation and, and receives its policies, it will check and say, hey, this application is not there anymore. It'll reinstall it. It'll continue to force that application to install on the systems no matter what the end user does. So if you always want to make sure that they have one particular thing or or anything, any applications, do this method. I'm just going to choose available and 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 proceed. Okay. So what's going to happen here? Uh, let's choose this. Obviously, you know these things like uh, the notifications for users. I don't know how fast this is going to show up, but we will find out. And then I'm going to apply supersedence to this. I'm going to come here. Um, so you guys know about this config manager applet, right? You can go to um, control panel, system, Config Manager. This is where you can force the actions to run um, right away. Oh, there's a new, there's a shortcut, and I know has a blog post on this, and um, you can do the run command. You can use the SMS controls, uh, uh, control SMS BFGRC, and it'll do the same thing. I'm going to force um, some actions, some policies to tell it to. So notice I've got 784 here, right? This should change to 785. And I'll do the same on this guy here too.
Ah, there it is. This will eventually go away. It's just that it's not clearing out right away. But so you notice, I have this 785, which I just deployed after I copied it. And now it's made available. Now I can click it here and I can install it. But I don't want to because I want it to actually automatically upgrade it. So what I'll do, I'll go back here. I just want to show you how that shows up, right? Now I'm going to create, um, let's say, uh, I just need this path here. Um, Let's create a fake application. Like instead of me putting it here, I'll just put it right here to show you what that looks like. Okay. So manual. Um, notepad plus plus. Uh, we can call it fake legacy, whatever you want. I'll just call it fake so you guys can see the difference. Really doesn't matter. I'm not choosing. I don't care. Uh, deployment types. Uh, it'll always default to manual. Again, use the same name. Okay, next, location, I don't care. Installation, call it whatever you want. Um, you can call it masala.exe if you want, doesn't matter. Okay, uh, detection method, this is where, this is important. So I'm gonna use the file system again, and I'm gonna choose this location and I think the application was Notepad++ plus plus EXE. And then here I'm telling it, but for the version, if it's less than 7.8.5.0, exactly what the application installation says. Next, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I usually choose just this stuff just to be, uh, but you're not deploying this anyway, so um, it really doesn't matter on this one. Okay. Okay. So, I'm just going to go ahead and move this to a, uh, uh, a new folder so you guys don't get confused. Um, let's call this retired. I'll move this guy. Come on. Everybody still following me? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. Good, good, good. All right. All right, so just to keep things clean, I just moved that old one out and I'll show you how to actually get rid of an application the, the proper way. So I've got the main application, the master application, which is distributed and deployed. Now I've got the fake one. It is not distributed and not deployed. But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna come to this master and we're going to come to uh, supersedence right here. We're going to do an add. And then uh, you're going to browse. And then you're going to, wherever you put that fake one, I just put it right here. I'm going to select that. That's why you give it a different name so you can see the, there's an there's a, there's a actual difference. Once you select it, It'll ask you, what do you want to do with it? I'm going to say, replace it with that. Okay. 
Okay. And then now I'm going to show you, I'm going to delete this deployment. So that deployment's gone. Now let's recreate a deployment. Again, I'm just doing it to my default collection. You can do whatever you want. All right, now do you notice here? Available, but in the bottom here, now that we have this new option, automatically upgrade any superseded version of the application. So even though I install it as available, I deploy it as available, which, what, what does that mean? That means that if I select this box, if any systems that do not have Notepad++ installed ever, if they never have it, they have it available in Software Center for them to choose and install it. Great. But if, if you choose this option here, it will, it will check and see, hey, do you have Notepad++? Oh, yes, you do. You have an older version, older than 785, so please upgrade to this 785 version because yours is like old. This is what I'm going to demo it to you. So I'm going to select that. I usually uh, select this as well, you know, allow users to attempt to repair installation because sometimes people have corruptions. They can just redo it from Software Center. It's a good habit to do. Again, I'm going to choose local time. UTC is uh, basically uh, 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 GMT, which is in uh, UK, right? So what time is it now? Okay, so I'll do it's almost 9.30. Let's do 9.30. Okay. And then I'm also going to say this if you if you recall 9 30 am right it's, uh, oh sorry yeah uh, good good catch good catch yep so if you notice this bottom section here this was not available earlier as an available installation the only reason this came up is because i selected that that new option to upgrade um, uh, older versions so now you can also give it a deadline and say hey you know what um, make it available at nine nine o'clock, but uh, but start installing it at nine thirty, uh, whatever, a.m. Or choose a different day and stuff like that. <clears throat> so for my organization, the way I do this is that when I deploy an application, I always test it in my test collections, like immediately, like there's no, you know, delay and stuff like that, because I want to know whether it works. And then when I deploy it to all my systems, I will give it a, you know, you can make it available whenever you want, doesn't matter. But then I will choose maybe like, you know, uh, in three days, three days from now, uh, make it mandatory. So I will find out if there's some issues, people are reporting, especially like things like Cisco, any connect VPN installation, they can, they can break. All right. So we'll choose this. Same thing, same thing, no difference. All right, so that's a new installation. And let's do the policies again. I'll run it on the other one too. Yeah, see, it disappeared. Just give it enough time because I think it'll. Maybe I should have chosen like uh, five minutes out 
so that we can see the difference here. Right. But this is supposed to work. It will work. <laughs> It'll upgrade to the to the new version. <laughs> so that's basically how you do supersedence. You can apply it to each and every one of these. Um, if I did, uh, for example, I think I have one here for key pass already. So let me just deploy a new version of key pass. I'll do a second one, and then then we can do questions and stuff. Uh, key pass. That's a two four four. Okay. Um, Do I have that deployed? Delete that deployment. So instead of doing a copy, I'm just going to go and modify this main one. I really don't. So as you can see, it is a bit tedious to do this method because you do have to come in and you do have to change some information every time there's a new version available. But it's it's there for free if you uh, really need it. I'll choose a different 244 program. I know that's going to be 244. And uh, legacy. Okay, now I'm going to apply it as a supersedence to this guy here. Go to the supersedence tab, add, browse, keep as legacy, replace it. Okay. One of the other things that when I do when I modify an application, uh, because sometimes you change the file name or things like that. I come to this tab here called deployment types, and then I update the content. Make sure your distribution points and stuff have the newer content for it. I should have done that for the Notepad++ too. All right. So now that I have this, I don't have any deployments. I'm going to deploy it again. Let's hope this thing upgrades to 244. Come on. And obviously, you can use PowerShell and stuff like that to do these, these things in a much faster way. But this is a demo for you. Install available. Upgrade. Okay, so back to my workstation here. Remember I pushed out Notepad plus plus seven eight five, and earlier we saw that it was it was saying install like this, right? Do you notice now it, I I didn't click install. It's already installed. It's 
it's giving me an option to say uninstall. That's how super sequence works. And if I go and check on um, this particular workstation, Seven eight five zero is installed on this system. Same thing is going to happen with. So. Oh, because it, it, yeah. So keypad should come up here very soon. Uh, I have yeah. a question. So sure. Go ahead. I, I noticed that uh, while putting the super settings in that application wizard, you did not select that uninstall checkbox. Mm, uninstall checkbox in the deployment? Yeah. yeah, in the deployment. So you change the option from do not replace to use the keypad script. And there was one more thing to select the, uh, to check the uninstall. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I didn't need to because um, if you if you select the uninstall, it's actually going to uninstall, but not because um, you can deploy applications as install or uninstall too, right? Um, yeah. I know what you're talking about. So I if you. Right. You don't need to do the uninstall because it'll automatically do it and then replace it with a new new version that you're telling it to, to do. Yeah. So my question was the same thing. Does that mean that if I check that uninstall, will it do the same thing what it does when we check the automatic upgrade of the older version? Is the both of them? I'm lo I lost you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm much better. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying, is that that option where we check the uninstall and the option where we check the automatic upgrade of the uh, superseded version, <coughs> is that both the option does the similar thing? Since basically both are uninstalling the older version and upgrading it to the newer version. Is my understanding correct? Hey, Harjit, this is Harsha. Can I jump in here for a minute, please? If you're okay. I think he's on mute. I, I don't know, Harjit, I think we are not able to hear you. If you are speaking, right, we lost you in between. Your sound is not coming. Okay, Anup, this is Harsha. In the meantime, can I answer her question? So, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, let yeah, me so let ping Harjit and you go ahead with your answer, please. Thank you. Okay. So what happens with the uninstall check mark button is, you know, usually the uninstall, usually when you check mark that uninstall button. So if you are at the application, if your previous application deployment has uninstall command, it would run that uninstall command and then it would run the install command for the new application. If you don't check mark that box, what it's going to do is, you know, it's going to, SCCM is going to identify like, oh, this is the older application, so I need to supersede that. But it's not going to run anything from the previous work, from the previous application where you have the uninstall command specified. It's, it's going to ignore that. If you check mark that, you know, then it's going to run the uninstall parameters, whatever you have defined in the previous application. So most of the applications nowadays, it comes with the in-place upgrade, especially the MSIs. Mm -hmm. If the application doesn't have any, uh, if the MSI doesn't have an in-place upgrade code, that's when, you know, you, you will be actually doing like, you know, clean and install and doing the fresh install instead of, you know, doing the in-place upgrade. Okay, so I, that means 
basically all the MSI applications, we can use that automatic upgrade of the super option. You, you depend it. how the you depend how the MSI has been built. Yeah. What, yeah. what I would suggest is open the MSI package uh, using Orca or any other uh, MSI tools, whatever you have in your organization, and look for the upgrade code table and see whether the upgrade code table has been defined properly. If it is defined properly, then it's going to do an automatic uninstall of the older versions. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, so I never... I never... Oh, can you hear me now? You're back. You're, you're back. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good, good. Yeah. So I never choose an uninstall option in the super speed end. I always, I've been I doing don't know, this for a long Sorry, sorry, before, before you go ahead, I don't know, like, I can hear a lot of background noise. If you can mute yourself, um, please, if you are not speaking, can you please mute yourself? Ah, there you go. Okay. So, I've been doing this for a long time with this method, and I've deployed all sorts of applications out there, like, really, like, a lot of different applications. And um, I've never had to change that supersedence method to uninstall. Um, I think probably once, maybe for one particular thing, but in in general, EXEs, MSIs, uh, even scripted applications, they will all just do what you need to do. The If you really, really want to uninstall an application, like you want to deploy and say, you know what, we don't want Notepad++ to be on any systems anymore in our organization, then when you're doing a deployment, instead of doing install and available, you can choose uninstall. And obviously it's going to be a required because you're forcing it to uninstall and then deploy it that way. Okay. So I will show you like, um, here's my organization. I've got a ton of applications that I've been deploying in the supersedence method. And I have no issues whatsoever. So, anyway, so we were uh, hoping that this will work, but... Hajit, I have a small doubt. Uh, can we define any restart during the application deployment? Suppose if you want to do restart after the installation, is it possible? Uh, that would be part of your uh, command line. So whatever your command line is, if you have a... You can, you can if there's a restart... Uh, capability, you can put it in there, but generally applications don't require. Uh, some applications will actually force a, a, a reboot, right? Um, I can come up with some examples right now, but uh, they'll say, you know, when you install it manually, it'll, at the end, it'll say, oh, please restart to complete it or whatever. Yes. Uh, but that is why you use those silent switches and the slash S or slash Q and slash, you know, no reboot or whatever, because you don't want um, the system to reboot um, right after they install an application on the user. So you can set up like maintenance modes for your collections and then do a reboot at that, that particular time, like overnight or after five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening or whatever you choose, right? Yeah. So, so if you if you can if you can hold off uh, with the questions, probably uh, Harjit will provide you some time to uh, have question and answers. Otherwise, probably we will uh, lose our like track. Um. Right. Yeah. So sure. a couple of um, um, uh, tricks for you guys. Uh, let me see if I can find some tricks. So sometimes when you install an application, so some applications will come with an EXE or uh, an MSI, for example, uh, Mozilla Firefox, right? When you go and uh, download it, it'll give you an EXE or MSI. You can choose which one um, uh, you, you prefer to, to, to use as your installer. I have, you know, for a while, I've been using the EXE method, and then, you know, and I just stayed with it. Uh, but what happens is sometimes you want to find out, let's say, um, let's say, for example, the seven zip here, you, you want to find out what the, the hash is or something like that. But, oh, wait, hold on. Let me look at uh, Mozilla Firefox. Let me see if this is a... Uh, 
EXT. I think this is an EXT. Yeah, it's an EXT. So I've got a slash silent here. So for example, if I come to a detection method, right? Sometimes you're looking for, oh wait, I I need, you know, the unseller, I need the MSI exec slash X and then the hash, right? But I don't know what the hash is. Like, how do I find that? There are some PowerShell ways you can actually do that, but it's a, you know, it can take a little bit of time. One of the tricks I do is that I will do this. I'll say add a class. I will say Windows installer, browse, go look at that um, folder. Click on that MSI and automatically it gives you that hash, which you can copy and use on the other side. Plus at the same point in time, it gives you that version number for that file. So instead of you trying to like figure out what it is and you know stuff like that, that's all you can do. So when I usually just copy this, um, let me show you a better one. I think uh, which one had that uh, hash? I think there was, I think it was this guy here, maybe. So a lot of people will ask, um, see, th see this hash here? So usually it'll come up by itself, right? When you use an MSI um, installer. But let's say you did a copy of this installer and then you did a, you know, because you, you're creating a new version. Let's say uh, whatever version this is, you're changing it. But you come here, this, this ID is gonna be the same because you copied it from the previous one. Then all you do, you just do this. Again, you do Windows installer, browse, and then look for that, uh, Where is it? Oh. It gives you that information. You copy that. You cancel out of this. You come here and you can add it to this path or wherever you need to, right? You may, may want to use that for this installation here and just change that to this particular thing. So various ways of doing it. So instead of using PowerShell or some tools to find, convert that, that information, that's how you can, you can do it. Um, that's some of my tricks. So the other th things you do is basically keep a logical flow of your applications. So, uh, you know, you obviously you have your source folder, you have your apps, and then whatever apps you have. And what I normally do is I keep different versions of it, right? Because I had deployed this one before, I had deployed this one, and then and then this is the newer one. And let's say 76.0 comes out or whatever, or 75.1 comes out or whatever. I'll create a new folder and I'll add the, the installers in there. And then in, later on, you can go in and remove these because they're starting to increase your, uh, your storage but if you don't use a supersedence method you do have to maintain all these versions here because each of these things you create has to be available here in order to apply as a supersedence with my method you don't have to do that you just have to create this fake and the master fake and master fake and master very simple approach uh, another thing I was going to show you, let's say you do um, want to get rid of some old applications, you're no longer deploying and stuff. Um, you know, you could do a delete. First, the first thing you do is you, you, you set it to retire. But what do you do is you right click and you do uh, revision history, I believe. And you should see all the different revisions here, because every time you made a change to that that particular application, whether you change the 
the the title or you added an icon or or whatever it all puts a revision here so you can actually you know kind of um, you know go to it and see it and stuff like that so i normally come in here and i'll do i'll delete the revision And again, I'm sure there's a PowerShell method to do this. Now, as soon as I do the release, the last one, it's completely gone. It get rid, it gets rid from from everywhere, from your distribution and all that fun stuff. That's how I was told to do it uh, a few years ago, and that's how I keep doing it uh, today. So that's basically the gist of. Ah uh, yeah. So you remember I deployed 2.44 as a uh, supersedence, and I 2.43. It is already now installed automatically. I did not have to do anything. So all my applications are getting patched and and updated to the to whatever versions I I push out. Pretty cool, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, and you can see on uh, I think this this uh, number three here. Um, I uh, you know workstation one and workstation two. I had manually installed those applications, the old applications first, and then they got superseded. No problem. It upgraded to a new version. Uh, number three, I have not installed these applications before, so they're just sitting here available because I don't have Notepad plus plus on this system. I don't have key pass on the system, you know, I don't have uh, yeah, that. Yeah, I don't have Acrobat reader on the system and so on and so forth. Right. So now if I'm just a user and this is a new machine or whatever, and I needed these applications, they're available here and I just click and I can get it. But the next time I push out 786 or 790, it will definitely automatically upgrade the, the, the version here because I already have uh, one instance of this particular application on the system. That's how you do supersedence. So this is a, uh, a way to, if you, have, if you have low budgets, you don't have the money in your organization to buy tools and things like that, this is the one way you can do to upgrade your applications to new versions. To, to maintain them for security reasons, to mitigate vulnerabilities and so on. If you do have a little bit of budget and you, you want a, a better tool to do a lot of automation and stuff, I personally, and I know Anoop has done some videos on it as well, is uh, this tool called Patch My PC. I don't get any money out of this, but I'm just gonna show you how it works real quick in case you're interested. When you install Patch My PC, you get this little application you will get your license information you will um, you can you can with patch my pc you can do you can deploy applications and you can also update applications like with software sent, uh, with uh, uh, software updates it uses uh, you know the uh, the software update point to deliver these applications like like you're deploying uh, windows updates right so for example, you come in here, um, you know, I can choose, um, uh, for example, you know, Elfan view maybe, hey, let's give me that. Um, malware bytes, whatever, whatever applications you need, uh, there's, a, there's a huge list uh, for it. Uh, PDF 24, um, if you are doing let me try to find something. Putty, maybe putty. Okay. There's a sync that you can run. I'm just going through this real quick just to show you a little bit of what this tool does. So I chose this Config Manager Apps option. I'm telling it to place these applications in the Patch My PC application node because I want it to separate from 
the applications that I manually deploy or, or install. So it goes to this location. <clears throat> and then if I want to do, you know, if I want to patch these applications, I can use the update mechanism and then select the applications again, and it will go and, and find that uh, for me. It also has a capability to check your, uh, your connect to your SCCM database, <clears throat> your SQL database, and looks for hardware inventory for all the systems um, in your organization uh, that you that are reporting back with, with data, and it'll say what applications have been installed. So I have a very small list here, but um, uh, you know, if I had more applications out there, you know, I would get a huge list that would show me like, oh wow, you know, there's this this user installed there's some weird installer here that I've never heard before. It'll show it here because it's coming from the database. And then you can select it and say, you know what, create an application out of it or create an update out of it. Um, so this tool is pretty robust, it's pretty good. And what it does is that it creates these applications automatically for you in your config manager. And then you can deploy it um, like you normally do with, with all, just like your other applications. Um, and what is nice about the stuff is that it keeps, uh, whenever you do that uh, sync from uh, the patch my PC tool, it will go out to the to these locations wherever the, the these companies provide their their installers and it'll add that to the repository and it'll update the the uh, the applications for you automatically so you don't have to do the create new copy and all that fun stuff it's all it'll just put new things here for you all the time and then you can use um, yeah, I'm not going. I'm not doing a lot of justice for this application because I'm just going through it real, real fast for you. Uh, but there, he's got videos, and Anoop's got videos too about this. So I'll show you all the applications that I can patch. And I can deploy it as a, like a Windows Update application, uh, like a patch. All right. So basically the gist of today was that we were gonna learn how to do supersedents and I think I've showed you how to do that. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, Ajit. Uh, actually, okay. Uh, yeah, Ajit, yeah, I just have one doubt. Uh, like uh, if you are installing any application, so before installing that, can we identify whether this application will require certain restart during um, deployments? Uh, because okay, so, so, right. Yeah, because the only what way happened, to know that is you have to install it on a test system first. Yes. So, so no, because what happened in my case uh, last month uh, when I've uh, done the testing on two or three systems uh, for certain applications, so it worked fine. But when I've made the deployment on the production uh, machines, and uh, at that time uh, I've made those uh, deployment in the required mode, and uh, at the same time I've made the two or three um, applications uh, to be uh, made available in the required mode. So in in that case, what happened? Like in certain, I mean, some servers took restart forcefully. Uh, so what I did is like uh, I've checked the deployment and went to the uh, return codes and I have to manually change the return codes to uh, no reboot. Then the rest of the server uh, didn't got restart. So in order to avoid that, like uh, certain applications, if I are uh, getting installed uh, with some other application at the same time. So can we uh, check such a, a scenario before making those deployments uh, in the production? You so the uh, did you select the add the uh, silent switches for it? Do not do a reboot. Yes, yes, I did that. Like a slash no reboot or slash r or something like that. Yes, yes. So when I've analyzed the logs, then I got to know that uh, it got uh, that certain uh, servers got reboot because uh, the particular return code that was uh, made available. And when I, and I further check the return code, so it got to know that it is a hard reboot. So I then edited those return code to zero, no reboot. So if huh. you can, 
Yeah, so if you can check I it. I never it. have to do, I've never, do you know what kind of application that is? Uh, I think it was like uh, Cisco WebEx and some other applications. For example, in Notepad, uh, if you check it on the deployment types and under detection, on the second last column, there will be a return code. Deployment types, yeah, open this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second last return so code. So you changed yeah. it here? Yes, so I have to manually edit it uh, mm. for one, uh, 1641 and 1618 at zero as success no reboot then only like uh, my rest of these servers didn't uh, got such a uh, uh, triggered for restarting so <laughs> this is a typical example for probably a bad packaging of msi exactly right yeah <laughs> so probably like uh, firefox right if if you if you have ever tried to deploy a firefox msi mm -hmm. you will see lot of issues with that MSI because that is kind of a bad MSI um, what do you call creation process they they are going through right within within Firefox probably this is one of that that kind of an application you are mentioning about but I, I honestly speaking I have not um, experienced this kind of an issue before but okay. probably but I heard about uh, this kind of issues before as, as well yeah Okay. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had an issue where application even after a silent install um, uh, do the reboots like that unless the applications have a uh, underlying dependency. So some of these applications they don't tell you, but they actually uh, when you actually um, expand them out, um, you can uh, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. I don't think I have it here, but um, but in uh, application sorry. deployment as well, there is an option that says determine the client behavior and you need to manually go and select do not do do not take any action. If the action is set to the config manager client to decide it might trigger a reboot. I do understand the question asked and this was one of the case that I came up with and the solution was to go back to the deployment. Uh, properties and manually select that option. Okay, I guess it's a case by case basis on the on the applications. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, itself. Right. So what what I'm saying is that sometimes you can, um, you know, right click on an exe file, and then, uh, for example, like Adobe Reader is one of them, right? When you actually download Adobe Reader, you don't get this part, but when you uh, you get um, you get something like this, and then when you when you um, you you expand the uh, the MSI or whatever it is, it gives you these these additional files, right? Your setup, a data, and all that fun stuff. Some of the applications will have like a, a Visual C plus plus or some other a dependency inside that you're not aware of. You're not seeing it because it's, it's all it's all packaged together. So when that happens, those things will trigger a reboot. So you have to be very careful also, like that's why you, you, you test it, make sure. So you may already have on the system that you tested it, you may, may already have that dependency installed from some other previous application, some Windows update or something like that. But the systems okay. that you're deploying to, you don't have that available yet so when it installs it it says oh this is this is required this is part of a, a patch and it requires a reboot because it's already passed the mandatory deadline for whatever your software updates were this has happened before even with um the sccm client anup and i did some um uh, we we both worked yeah. together a few years ago remember yeah, I was about to say that you had the same experience in the production, right? <laughs> After yeah, client yeah. upgrade, the client got restarted suddenly, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, you you'll you'll see. I think it's in here. Um, let me see. To add one point, I believe we have to go to the documentation part of any application once. To understand the behavior of that application sometimes yeah that's true that's true 
so they so give, look, look at this they right give, they give different requirements and uh, uh, could be and uh, they they give some certain ideas on whether it might require a reboot or it doesn't require a reboot like that right i so when whenever i have users or departments ask me to deploy an application for them i always ask them sure give me the installer and give me the find me the um command line uh silent installation uh uh you know text for it they'll be like i don't know i don't know i'm like well you need to find that for me or if not i'll have to find it but there are some applications you go and you cannot get that information they just don't have it that is when you run into these problems uh sometimes i've seen uh where the 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 command line it makes a difference for example slash q whether you use a lower case q or you use a upper case q or a lower case s or an upper case s it all depends on how that application was developed it's a it's a case by case basis so what i want to show you here is that so this is the sccm client that is uh, uh, available from the sccm server but when you when you expand further into it you can see there are some additional things that it requires right visual super redistribution and i don't know what version this is so what happens is in the past when uh, i think it was uh, uh, sccm 2012 r2 whatever when you know they were moving from one version to another and stuff not a problem you know you upgrade your thing and you automatically creates new um, sccm clients they get distributed clients get upgraded great but there was one version of uh of a sccm upgrade that they changed the uh one of the uh visual c++ uh requirements and it wasn't documented and what that visual c++ was actually a very old software update from like a few years before so when you are deploying software updates in your organization and if you if you have a um you know a deployment that you've made mandatory like a year ago or whatever and that particular visual c++ or dependency is part of that old deployment it's obviously going to say hey wait this is way past you you need to install oh wait it also requires a reboot go do it now and all of a sudden all our systems were rebooting like out of the blue and we were wondering like why and that was the case so it could be part of that too harjit if you can check on the chat i have shared a screenshot and i'm i think that's the option that you know we usually forget to modify on the chat okay i'm not going to see the chat though unless i or oh, oh, that's okay if you can just do right click on any of the application on your screen and go to the deployment <clears throat> and here yeah go to the deployment types and mm -hmm. uh, edit there has to be a user experience tab a uh, yes click yep and if you see the last option should configuration manager enforce specific action specific behavior regardless of application intended behavior and by default it is determined behavior based on return codes and that will right. trigger a reboot if it requires a reboot yeah and if you make no specific action then you will be 100% sure the machine won't restart right i've honestly i've never had to do this uh for any of my applications that i've deployed i've never so it's a very unique cases that i guess you need to do something like this uh, also like in my organization which i didn't show you guys here we got some very um unique scripts that we use to uh deploy some of these applications because for example things like what we discovered like things like uh mozilla firefox um uh, you know flash 
uh, Java is, uh, is another one where if, if it is being used on the system, let's say if it's open, right, it's being used and, 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 and stuff like that, and Java is open and all that stuff, when you deploy these applications, they will actually fail to install. They, they just won't work because it's, it's open in the system tray. It's open in uh, one of the DLLs is running and stuff like that. So we had actually, one of my colleagues had, had created a VB script uh, a few years ago where it'll go and look for any instances of that application and kills it first, removes it from system tray, removes it from uh, task manager and all these places. And once that is done, then follow and install the application. And that was all in part of the same command line um, uh, in the installation uh, properties. So there are various ways of doing this stuff. I'm just showing you like very simple, you know, EXE and MSI and just do that. But the way we have it is, is pretty, pretty convoluted. So to avoid those kind of things. Maintenance modes, maintenance uh, windows is another way you can uh, manage your, your reboot timeframes. So you can always deploy, make them install, but then they don't reboot until specific uh, maintenance windows that you set for your collections. That's another way of always making sure. Any other questions? Uh, Hi, okay. Hi. Uh, sorry, uh, Kayam, uh, when you make that uh, uh, change as no specific action, uh, the system so in reports, will it show like pending for a reboot or something in the report? Uh, I mean, I, I agree that it will not do any manual uh, automatic reboot, but uh, in the reports also it will say differently or it will wait for the reboot to complete. Do you no. have seen that? Uh, it will never say pending reboot unless you are doing this for a Windows update or something. For an application that is installed, the detection policy will report back that the application has been successfully installed and right. you have suppressed the reboot. So you don't need uh, any other. It would be like a completed successfully. Okay, even though error code is something else, uh, still it's uh, still a little Well, if the installation has failed, then it is failed for sure. But if the error code yeah. is for pending reboot, it won't say anything. Yeah, okay. he's right because it's all based on the detection method that I mentioned before. Applications are all based on this, um, this detection method that you do, right? So it doesn't matter whether it needs a reboot or not. If, if it finds it here in this path, it finds that whatever you set, whether it's a registry, you know, HK local machine, um, you know, and so on and so forth, if it is there, it finds that particular key or, or 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 data that you that you specified. That's all it matters. That's all it cares about. It won't report back on on anything else. So I had like a, a notepad um, that I you know captured some some information before. Like you know this is this you know I was going to show you guys some of these things, but you know. Uh, uh, I guess you guys get the gist of it, but you know when I deploy, uh, uh, you know the Cisco AnyConnect, you know VPN client, you know this is the, the installation it uses, this is the uninstallation, this is the detection method where where it looks for uh, in this path. Uh, it looks. Harjit, if you are showing the notepad, we are we are not able. At least I am not able to see that. I can still see the console. Oh, you're not seeing it? Okay, hold on. Um, give me one second. Uh, just give me a second. I'll copy it over to the... Okay, let me put it. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, not bad. You guys can see that now? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. So I, I just created like, you know, real quick yesterday. I'm like, oh my God, I got to show these guys all these different things. And, you know, so you can see like, for example, like, you know, you need to look for it in, uh, you know, here's the path. It looks for java.exe. And then the detection method, you also say, and also look in this registry for this particular um, hive and, and key and string equals to, you know, x86 if it's a 32-bit. Uh, or look for this particular thing and so on and so forth. Um, so you got various ways of doing detection methods for it to to determine that is it there or not. Um, for example, like when you install Java on a system, it it puts it in different locations of the uh, on the system that you you know. So when you if you just choose like, oh, just look in this path, it really, it, it won't upgrade because it's it's not determining this other places that it needs needs that information from. So this is a lot of trial, test, um, headache, and troubleshooting that 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 created these these things. Adobe Flash Player, it's the same thing. Um, I don't know if I have a legacy version of it. Um, I think I showed you guys this before, but I could be wrong. Let me see if I can find. Yeah, I think I did. Right? So Flash Player, look for ActiveX, look in this hive, look for this key, look for this value, and this. Um, or look in the SysWow6432 location and so on. So these are all trial and error uh, methods that we that we found if, to to successfully deploy applications. Every application is different, right? You got different silent installers. You got different command lines. You got sometimes you got to do something like this. Don't check for the updates. Um, you know, don't create the desktop shortcuts and stuff like that. So. But you know what, um, you, you guys feel free to definitely, um, you know, contact me or contact us on, and use the how to manage devices uh, forum, which is very successful to post questions and, and, you know, hey, I've got this thing, I'm trying to deploy this particular application, I'm having issues, you know, maybe give us some, uh, um, uh, you know, your screenshots or, or or log files and stuff like that, and then can help you with that. Or if you're looking for, you know, silent installers for it. Um, one of the things that I just dif discovered is that, for example, like uh, you guys know about this application called PDF Creator, right? Um, it's a free... PDF Creator. So a lot of a lot of places were using this um, PDF tool called PDF Creator. It was uh, was it's there's a free version of it, and it was it's available for many 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 years. And um, uh, you know because people didn't have the license for Adobe Acrobat, uh, you know the the full version is it's really expensive. And this tool actually helps you like modify and edit PDFs and, and things like that. But what I've discovered is that uh, the newer versions after version, I can't remember, 3. Point, uh, let me see what version it is now here. But whatever the version is uh, now, they no longer provide you with a silent installation uh, string this application does not do that anymore. So you're not able to deploy this in any fashion in your organization um, because they, they just removed that capability out of it. So you will find when you deploy this, you're like, hey, it used to work. It worked last year, it worked the year before, it worked 
you know, six months ago. And it, it comes down to this, because th this particular organization decided that they changed that. They don't want to give that uh, ability for people just to deploy the free version. Uh, they want you to use a professional version. So many different scenarios like that. Hi, Ajit. Anything I else? A... Yeah. Yeah, it's here. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. I have uh, machines with uh, multiple versions of Mozilla Fire. We lost you. Hello. Can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah. 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 I have... I have machines with multiple versions of Mozilla Firefox installed. So, for example, Mozilla Firefox 56 and 49, 48 versions. One is okay. in 32 bit, one is in 64 bit. If I okay. do an, an super, uh, in, install of a new version, suppose 75 version, with the super precedence, what you have shown, that will work yeah. or not? Oh, yes, definitely. Means that uh, you both have... the version. Yeah. So looking at my screen, you have Mozilla 74, you have Mozilla 75, you have Mozilla 72, and so on and so forth, right? But all those applications, Mozilla yeah. older versions are not deployed through SCCM. It is manually installed by the user itself. Okay. So, okay, so they are manually installed by the users, but now you're trying to, you're trying to, get them to use the newer version like whatever is the latest version right 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 okay so very easy that's why that's why you use the supersedence method because you don't know what versions they have out there you you have no idea right they could be using mozilla uh mozilla 10 mozilla you know 25 right like very very old versions of it all you care about is what is the latest version available you deploy that and you use that particular uh detection method like hey this is version 75 for example if i i mean this i think i have 75 here <clears throat> i'll show it to you real quick and do you guys know how to get the uh, downloads for mozilla actually um, I think it's <clears throat> HTTP or HTTP? Oh, okay, yeah. So for Mozilla downloads, you go to ftp.mozilla.org. You go to publication. You go to Firefox. You go to releases. And then you see you have all the versions that they put out. <clears throat> They got the nightly builds and stuff like that. So what we'll do, let me keep going down here. Come on, almost there. Okay, so 70, 74. <clears throat> so the latest public one, a production one is 75. So you go to 75, and you should go to Windows 32. <clears throat> And then you look for your um, language, I guess. I always go to ENUS. And then you have the installer here. You got the MSI, you got the EXT. This one here, you got to be careful, right? This one here that says Firefox installer, that is really not the installer. What this is, is uh, it's called a sub installer. It's actually, it's a, you look at the, the file size, it's 312K. This one is 447 megabytes, that's kilobytes. What this is, is like when you go to Mozilla <coughs> or Firefox.com and you click on install, it downloads the stub installer, which actually then goes and pulls the, the, the actual installer. Like it's like a mini installer for like easy, um, yeah, for, for the end users. So this is what you do. So anyways, so I've got a copy here. All you need to do, you can always, you can just change this. You can say, you know what, 
I don't even need a version number here. Um, So you point to the wherever your latest application is, your most recent application. And then I think it was 75.0, if I'm not mistaken, I can go check. Yeah, I think it was 75.0. Something like this. All right, detection method. So this is tricky, right? Because now I need to know exactly what it is. So things like Firefox and stuff like that, it is always best to install it first and then find out what the, the, the version number is. So I think I have it. Uh, um, give me one second here. Firefox, Firefox. Seven three nine eight. Seven five zero zero seven three nine eight. Okay. Three nine eight. I'm going to take that. And then I don't know if I have supercedent set for the, the legacy, but we'll check. So I have it. And I need to go. Oh, wait. Okay, so now I've got a 75. I'm going to stop deployment of this uh, previous one. Oh, I don't have a deployment. Okay. So I'm just going to update the content because it was previously distributed. And I can do a deployment. And then you just do the usual method, like how you deploy when you want to make it available. Oh, it wasn't distributed. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I just have one question here. Uh, is supersedence only limited to applications which are made available? Uh, you can do required too, but it, that that drains out because when you're doing a required, you're obviously telling it that you are forcing that particular yeah. application to install. So supersedence is really like. Yeah, definitely upgrade from one app, one version to another and also make it available for people that don't have it. Uh -huh. It's the safest method to do that.
हर्चित बिलीट डिलीट यूजर्स फेवरेट्स एंड बुकमार्क्स फॉर मोजिला लाइक एप्लीकेशन इफ यू यूज सुपर सीडेंस नो इट शुड नॉट इट जस्ट इट जस्ट डूइंग इट जस्ट डूइंग द वे uh the way the built in installer uh the built in application updates its own own self now it keeps all that profile stuff together i've been doing this for a long time and never had any issues like that so yeah so basically that's what you do you deploy it like that right you always just always keep the newer version so if 76 comes out you create a 76 version you change the 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 fake one you use the detection deploy it now any of your previous versions of firefox will always update to the latest one is there any option to kill the task of somebody is opened this mozilla firefox browser and we deployed this one this will fail act automatically right it depends i think when i was doing it in the past in the last few years um there was a problem like if they had it open they had some some you know uh java and things like that open in the browser and all that stuff it it would actually fail because the processes were like hey we're still actively using but lately i think is i think it does take care of it itself um uh, i have like a script that i can see whether i can you know uh share that with you guys or not where they'll go in and try to delete that stuff uh, that option that option is also in this uh, model archit we can we can use any exe or whatever is if you want to kill that one by creating the application yeah yeah that option is still uh, in application model to to kill a like, previous version yes yes uh, yes yes like he asking that if mozilla is already running can we kill that yes so we can you we can grab the exe whatever is running and we can put in application when we creating so there is a option when we create application i believe in uh, if you can open your console it's maybe it's called install behavior yeah right it's right install behavior right. tab on the top yeah right. that one that, that we showed you, earlier right 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 install behavior and then you can put whatever you want to kill before installation yeah uh, i like your problem. name by the way cm we can the top yeah. install behavior install yeah, behavior yeah, on install the top behavior. very very first option install behavior up up to journal yeah here you can add whatever you want to kill right yeah. but it will not customer to you need to that that's a feature in sccm you need to turn on that feature if you don't have that feature turned on you know in the sccm console then you will not see that option yeah can you tell me which is that feature i can i can hear you what did you say uh, no it is a feature in sccm it is a feature in sccm that needs to be turned on to get that option I think it's called as uh, pre uh, install behavior or post install behavior or something like that. If you go to the features tab on the console, you know that's where it needs to be turned on to take the advantage of that feature. I think that is that is in build with like the very first well, uh, model of SCC uh, uh, yeah application. I don't yeah, think so. We need to turn any. Yeah, yeah. It seems like you know they did it automatically, no? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the first model, it's a feature that they introduced. And yeah, then when you are it. deploying the when you are uh, scheduling your deployment, once you know your deployment time is done, you know you can automate. You have an option to like you know automatically close the open applications when you are triggering the deployment. That's going to kill the deployment automatically. Yeah, but if you are uh, deploying that as an available mm -hmm. mode, then user also get a pop up uh, saying that you are yep. running this application. You have to close this before. Yeah. Uh, for required model, it's or as you say, automatic close that uh, task for you. And someone yeah, is so asking the only, about the only issue with required is like um, when you do a required is that they're always going to get that application no matter what. 
whether they need it or not. And if they uninstall, they're going to keep getting it over and over and over. So it, it depends, there are certain right? applications, you, right? Based there are certain on your applications, like some security stuff, right? Some, like when you're running, like uh, you need to deploy like some security uh, tool to to check for vulnerabilities or, or uh, hacking or something like that, right? They're like fire, fire eye agent and things like that. Then you want that to be required because you want that particular tiny little agent to, to be on all the systems and reporting back to the, you know, the mothership to say, you know, this system has, you know, these vulnerabilities on, on it or whatever, right? So it's a very use case. Like I don't deploy applications that are required unless they really have to be there. Um, sometimes you can deploy like particular uh, hot fixes and things like that. You really need to, um, you know, like a bit locker, hot fix or so something like that. So, so many different things you can do. Okay, so probably probably uh, we can take, um, this is Anup here, probably we can take last two questions or three because um, I know it's pretty late for Harjit over there. So I don't want to, I don't want to extend the session further, right? So probably we can take uh, last one or two questions. Anup, one question. Yeah, I, I heard it. My question. Yeah. Yeah. So it's regarding the update, right? In the Microsoft uh, considering Office application, right? We, when we are talking about update, right? It does not upgrade that application, right? While for for the third party, right? We see the example from uh, taking the Mozilla. So it is upgrading the application. So for some of the, like we, if you talk about Adobe, right? It does not. If there are any kind of security updates like provide, so they are not going to upgrade their application. They are fixing their security bugs, right? So how that is going to manage through this application? Or in this model, it will upgrade the application. It does it does not so means that will going to fix their security updates. So, well, if they fix a security update in their application, they're always going to give you a newer version of it, right? Like for example, Acrobat Reader here, instead of 242, it's probably gonna be 275 or something like that, or 20.7. So they will give you a brand new installer for it, for you where they have included the, the bug fixes or security fixes or feature updates. So you have to go and download that and then add it to your deployments like I showed you in the, you know, uh, in the repository. Okay, so as so, per my understanding, yeah. So for third party, it will be always an upgrade, it, right? Yes. And for you, you so, that, so yeah. uh, for applications, no matter what, it needs a manual intervention, right? You need to be the one to go get the installer, to go create the 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 deployments and and the the name and the version numbers and the detection method right so this is why i said this is like you know if you really have to you can follow this method but there are other tools out there if you have the budget like patch my pc patch my pc will do it automatically for you it'll go get the installers whatever brand new is available out there it'll create the the, the deployments for you so there's so many other tools out there some cost a lot of money and some, you know, um, you can, I think you can also use uh, uh, PS app deploy uh, PowerShell uh, uh, methods to, to do this, this stuff. So all depends how much effort you want to do, right? Right, right. But yeah, so, so that, the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Haji. No, so, yeah. so the bottom line is that you always, if you are doing applications in your organization, you always have to know, are there new versions out there? You have to keep track. You got to monitor Twitter. You got to monitor forums. Uh, you know, you always have like a VM or another system that you have all the application, most of the applications installed there. 
you know, FileZilla, uh, Adobe, and 7-Zip, Notepad, whatever you want, right? And then you can determine whether, hey, is there, is there, uh, did they release a new version out? Let me go check in uh, the manufacturer's site and, and get it. And then that also helps you find the, the, the location where it's installed in the, on the particular system to get the, the file number and things like that, like I showed you before, right? Like properties, details, those kind of things. So. Okay, so last question. Hi, Arjit. Uh, yeah. Hi, there are, there is a lot of background noise. If you are not speaking, can you please mute yourself? I think it's coming from Sujit. Sorry, Sujit. I think uh, your mic is a bit bad. Hi, Arjit. Yeah. Okay, yeah, now I can hear you. I think. Hi, Arjit. Hi. So my, question, so my question is, uh, in my uh, lab, I want to upgrade SAP version. And I have tested in my uh, environment, uh, test lab, it's working fine. But whenever I uh, deploy in production, because some of the users are used the same time, uh, SAP is running. Yes. So yep. it's a fail. Yes. That's, that's what we were talking about earlier where you have to do that uh, um, you either have to script it like uh, you know create a batch file or something like that that says you know look for this location is it open is it running and you know okay. kill it before you do it or you do that uh, the method that these guys were telling you about earlier with the install behavior and stuff um, which was uh, because this is a critical application in our environment. In this application, we use the so many transactions in business. So we don't kill before user uh, information. Yeah. So you. So uh, there is no. Use that, sorry. Um, so uh, just to just to add on that, right? Probably you can use that pop-up uh, application, right? There is some pop-up application provided by, I think, uh, I don't I don't remember exactly who provided that. There's an IT community, community application, right? Where yeah. you can publish some pop-up to the user. Please close the application or something like that, right? Right, I know. Oh, the other the other thing you can do is also like if you're doing software updates and you're requiring reboots after software updates, right? So and then you got maintenance windows set up for your collections, and you okay. know like okay after the software updates are installed, you after one hour or six hours or eight hours whatever is you are forcing them to reboot, then you can actually then make your deployments mandatory after that particular time frame, right? So let's say you're requiring reboots uh, after eight o'clock in the morning. So maybe eight eight thirty or something or, or whatever in the morning, that is when this application installs because you know after a reboot, people have not actually launched that SAP application. So you're gonna yeah. get more successes that way, right? So there's yeah, always like trick yeah, that tricks like that that you have to implement to 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 get the success rates. Every organization okay. is different. So. Okay. All right. I think. Yeah. yeah Good. So, Hajit. No, I, I think mean, I think we we covered everything, but definitely reach out to uh, to me or whatever, and and I can definitely help you guys out. Okay, so thank you, yeah. thank you very much, Harjit, and it was it was really interesting and uh, very knowledgeable session from you. And even though, like, I I learned I learned a lot of stuff today as well, right? So this is kind of very real world examples we are hearing and uh, we um, we are learning, right? During these weekend weekend sessions, right? So thank you very much, Harjit. I think uh, all your experience with application deployment for many many years you shared over here for us. Uh, I really appreciate appreciate you for that and um, <laughs> virtual claps for that, right? From my side, right? 
so thank you thank you <laughs> so so very very interesting and very knowledgeful presentation thank you thank you uh, okay and uh, before we finish off right uh, tomorrow we have a session around uh, ssrs reporting and how to build ssrs report how to design a ssrs report by kannan so please join us uh, on the same time same channel same place right so once again before we go uh, thank you thank you to harjit for a wonderful presentation thank you yeah, thank you everybody thank you, for having me thanks harjit thank you harjit thank you anup thank you harjit